Welcome everybody. Uh, I'm James Basinko and I'm really thrilled to welcome you to our, our seminar for today. Uh, before we start, I want to review just a couple quick uh, housekeeping items. Uh, please remember to sign in. The link is in the chat. Um, uh, because of the kind of narrative nature of the presentation that Dr. Dowd's going to present today, she prefers that we write some clarifying questions in chat during the presentation and save the like the hard hitting questions for the end so we can really tackle those in a real discussion format. Um, also, given that uh, that our guest is is um, beaming in from the UK, uh, we asked uh, students who are interested in the pro seminar to reach out to Esmeralda and she can find an alternative time to be able to interact with, with Dr. Dell. Um, it's pretty late there already and we appreciate her staying up late with us. Um, so with that, actually, let me let, our, let, let me introduce our guest speaker. So uh, Dr. Jennifer Beam Dowd is Associate Professor of Demography and Population Health at the University of Oxford. And she's also the Deputy Director of the Leverhulme Center for Demographic Science. Uh, she uh, earned her PhD in Demography and Economics from Princeton, did a postdoc as a health uh, RWJ Health Society Scholar at the University of Michigan. Her work focuses on how the economic and social world get under the skin to impact our biology. This has included a lot of work in the biology of stress, infections, and immune uh, function, as well as the human microbiome and exploration of reasons under, uh, underlying the stalling life expectancy in the US and Europe. Relevant today, uh, to today's talk, she's currently researching social and demographic factors related to COVID-19, and is uh, part of a really exciting all-female team of PhD scientists interpreting COVID-19 science for a general audience at Dear Pandemic. So we hope to hear about all of this uh, over the next hour and a half. Uh, and I uh, ask you to please join me in welcoming Dr. Jennifer Beam Dowd. Thank you, James. And thanks, it's great to see so many familiar names and faces, even in little boxes. So I. Hopefully I'll see you guys in person next time. Let me get this going. Uh, are we having that same problem, James? With the- Yeah, I mean, it, it's fine. We can see your slides just fine. It's just that we also see uh, oh, no, no. the okay. preview on the left. Yeah, I got it. There okay. you go. You're good now. <laughs> we got it. Thank you. Um, so as James said, uh, this is going to be not presenting a, a single paper. Um, it's kind of been a very whirlwind year, as it has been, I think, for many of us. And I wanted to talk a bit about my professional experiences during the pandemic, which has included um, some research, but also um, a new field for me of science communication and trying to communicate um, what we do to a general audience. So. Um, this has kind of evolved over the year as a bit of a retrospective and how I've seen um, demography really contribute to the understanding of the pandemic. Um, and overall, I'd really like, I guess, to start a conversation, hopefully in the discussion about the ways in which a social science and population perspective um, have been really crucial to understanding the pandemic thus far and you know, how we might think about our contributions going forward as well. Um, but overall, I'm sort of, um, you know, giving a, a pitch, I hope, especially for the students and early career researchers about the, the value and importance of this training, um, which I think has been, um, as I said, just really something that's contributed a lot during the pandemic. Um, so to start, if you can kind of put yourself back in March of 2020. Um, I know that's that's kind of hard now to think back, but you know, like many of you, I was watching the data coming out with a lot of interest. Um, but you know, in January and February, we, we really didn't know where this was all going, so it wasn't professional interest yet. Um, but as things started to escalate here in Europe, um, in my center, we had some colleagues um, who were in Italy and went back at the end of February in anticipation of some of these lockdowns and we're sending back um, reports. And, and that's when it started to, to take on a more serious um, professional interest. And I think it's also hard to remember that this was still a time when we really didn't have a handle on some of the basic characteristics of, um, of this virus, including how fatal was it. And this you know, turns out 
is a really important thing to understand, um, especially in planning what sort of steps as a society are we willing to take? Are we willing to shut down schools and society um, to prevent this spread? So, um, you know, getting a handle on just how fatal this was, was really important. And, you know, Italy was one of the first places outside of Wuhan um, where we started to see a lot of mortality. Um, and some of you may have um, also been following some of this coming out. Um, the Public Health Institute in Italy was actually really helpful about putting out daily numbers um, as things were happening um, in March 2020. So this right-hand column is um, what we would call the case fatality rate, uh, which I'm sure you all know very well by now, but just in case, um, that's where the denominator would be confirmed cases of COVID and the numerator, um, you know, confirmed deaths due to COVID. So um, we did know that this was probably very overestimated early on because we were not doing a lot of testing and only the most severe cases were coming forward. Um, but nonetheless, for, you know, kind of a, a wealthy developed country um, with a decent healthcare system, these case fatality rates were quite staggering. And I think we also, um, as good demographers, just noticed very quickly how concentrated um, these, these deaths were um, in older ages. Um, you can see that you know, sort of less than 5% uh, of the deaths were under age 60 um, as far as the distribution of deaths. Um, and so again, this, this sort of clicked with us that um, you know, why were we seeing such high mortality in Italy? Um, it could be because Italy is one of the oldest countries in the world, second only to Japan. Um, I think it has 23% of its population over age 65. Um, and so obviously with um, this really steep relationship between um, age and mortality for COVID, um, it meant that you know, age, age structure of different countries as well as within countries um, might play an important role in how the pandemic ended up playing out. And we wrote, so we wrote this preprint on um, March 15th that we released 2020. And, um, you know, thanks to Twitter that very day, we found out that, you know, indeed all demographers in the world were thinking exactly the same thing, um, looking at these numbers come out. So um, we were really happy actually to, to have um, kind of been able to state the most, you know, obvious demography thing ever. Um, and it, it really, in some ways, it really um, is a very simple point. And so our paper um, took a couple of stylized examples to see how age structure um, might impact the, the overall burden of mortality for COVID. And you know, at this time, the pandemic had not spread to other countries. Italy was you know, really at the forefront outside of China. There was a little bit going on in Korea at the time, but we know now that they, they managed to, to stem that transmission. So this was really an exercise in thinking about how might we anticipate you know, where this is going to be particularly bad. Um, and so we gave um, just a couple really stylized examples of countries with different um, types of age structures. Um, we assumed that 10% of the population would become infected and that would be uniform across age which is obviously very simplistic, um, but also optimistic that it would be 10%. And we use the case fatality rates that were coming out of Italy at the time, which as I said, are, you know, are quite high because of the, the lack of testing. Um, but the main take home you know, point of these examples was that um, if you have an older age structure, just more people at older ages, um, that you know, given a fixed set, uh, a fixed prevalence of infection, um, and this really steep age gradient in mortality um, that you would see a lot more deaths um, for countries with older age structures. And um, in this example with Brazil and Nigeria, it's kind of a little um, more stark because of the extremely young age structure of Nigeria. Um, and you can see that in this scenario, Brazil was expected to have um, much higher mortality. And you know, obviously things have played out a lot since then. Um, Brazil has indeed been hit very hard, but you know, probably not only for this reason of age structure. Um, you know, I think they've seen also a lot more deaths at the middle and younger ages compared to what we've seen in Europe. Um, and Africa, you know, is also a story I think we need to really understand 
better what's going on there. I think it's likely that their younger age structure has been protective um, in some respects, but I think um, there's probably also a lot of other things going on, um, you know, to explain the different path of the pandemic there. Um, you know, they definitely have a lot more experience with surveillance and infectious disease. Um, but I think there's also a lot of questions about um, how, how much the case and, and mortality, um, you know, registrations there are accurate and if we really know um, how bad things are. So, you know, see, these are things that have played out over time. Um, but back in the beginning, um, we suggested that this, you know, would be also an important thing to think about within countries that, you know, regionally and locally, um, populations with older um, age structures might be more vulnerable, especially to hospitalizations and severe disease. And, you know, this was the, the time of flatten the curve and everything and trying to, to stay under that threshold of hospitals getting overwhelmed. Um, so this was um, the first piece of that puzzle, um, of that, that paper. And I just wanted to give some more examples of how you know, this age adjustment actually ended up and thinking about age structure was really important even very early on. Um, so this was a tweet um, from Usama Bilal um, showing the raw data coming out of New York City about um, the ethnic breakdown of, of COVID mortality. And he pointed out that you know, if you just look at the raw data, 29.7% of the deaths were um, in the Latinx population. Um, and that was roughly proportional to their um, representation in the population. Um, but when you account for the fact um, that the Latino population is much younger, um, you know, the raw data were kind of obscuring um, a disparity in that respect. And um, again, this just really struck me because in those early months, you know, you know any sort of data that came out was, was so valuable, um, but we we're not accustomed to receiving all of this, a, a fire hose of very raw and kind of uncleaned or even unage adjusted um, data. And so, you know, the media and, and lots of other um, places that were reporting this sort of data, you know, might not have had an understanding of, of what these numbers meant. Um, but those of us who understand the important importance of age adjustment all the time could kind of see, um, see through some of this raw data that was coming out. And I think it's just an example, again, of how, um, of how our perspective and our training that was kind of automatic ended up being um, really important um, in this emergency situation. And the second part of our original paper was also drawing attention to, um, to another aspect, demographic aspect that we thought might have been important for the high mortality burden in Italy. And this was the high level of intergenerational co-residence and contact um, between families. Um, and this again was really just a, a hypothesis from some of my colleagues um, in Italy who knew that some of the original seeding of the pandemic had come into Milan um, and a lot of young people commuted out of Milan um, to their villages in the Lombardy region and you know, lived with multi-generational households and dined together all the time. Um, and so we just suggested that you know, it could be the fact that it's an interaction between an older age structure and a high degree of intergenerational contact that can accelerate the spread um, to these from young people um, to the older, more vulnerable populations. Um, and this is a figure from Francesco Bellari um, and colleagues who, who showed some data from SHARE surveys about the different distribution of um, you know, older adults who have daily contact with their um, adult children across different countries. Um, and you can see that Italy is quite high on this. Um, and so again, this is not something that's necessarily deterministic. We can see that you know Greece went a long time without too much um, COVID problems, but um, in some respects, we saw this as again kind of fuel on the fire that an inter you know if the infection has taken root in the younger population, it can much more easily get to that older, more vulnerable group um, if there's high levels of intergenerational contact. And we got um, kind of unexpectedly a lot of press in Italy about this, that we were blaming the family um, for, for this high level of mortality. So um, that certainly was not our intention, but um, 
it did get you know some conversations going about um, how how you know societies might want to think about protecting those vulnerable older groups, um, especially in the context of um, cultures where there might be a lot of caregiving, um, you know, and kids were being sent home from school. So who's going to take care of them? Um, that this might actually be something important to think about. And I think this issue, you know, has continued to play out. Um, there was definitely an element of this in the US, I think, with immigrant populations who are more likely to live in multi generational housing, um, you know, seeing higher burdens of transmission. But it's been something that's been, you know, I think it will really require some micro level data to, to tease out, you know, what the household level risk factors for transmission um, were in the end. There has been some good, um, one good study from Sweden, There's, there, there are probably more by now, but um, that had, of course, registry data in Sweden linked to mortality um, and living you know, with a younger person. If you were um, above age 65, living with um, a working age um, family member was associated with a higher mortality risk. So um, this does seem to have played out, but it's, um, it was a bit debated for a while and, and there were some papers um, published in PNAS looking at ecological correlations between percentages of the population that you know, lived in multi-generational households and mortality and not surprisingly not much um, association at the ecological level, but I think we are seeing it more in the micro data. Let's see. So, so that was kind of the very, the very beginning. Um, of at least my journey and thinking about how demography was um, important for understanding COVID. And it really continued um, you know, throughout, throughout the months. And so I'm gonna just give some other examples of where I think um, demographic insights have been very important um, as the months played out. And one of the first things, um, as I mentioned, was trying to really get a handle on how fatal this disease is. This was really a key parameter for making a lot of other decisions about trade-offs we were making as a society. Um, and you know, this turned out to be really challenging because of getting, you know, getting this denominator right of, of how many people have actually been infected um, was not easy. We knew we were not testing very much. Um, and it turns out, you know, not very many countries, well, at least the US was not very on top of fielding um, rep population representative zero prevalence studies. Um, and so zero prevalence studies, you know, are taking blood samples from people and looking for evidence of previous infection. So this is a way in which we can try to get a handle on how many infections were actually missed um, and get a denominator. And of course, there were some high profile studies coming out of uh, California, um, Santa Clara and Stanford um, that were using, you know, kind of these very convenient, uh, convenient samples that were um, extremely not representative and estimating a very low infection fatality rate um, that were causing big waves at the beginning. Um, but over time, we did get some better data. The UK actually has um, an amazing study. It didn't really start till after the first wave, sort of May and June of 2020, but um, we actually do every two weeks, um, a couple hundred thousand people um, of a nationally representative sample for, for acute testing, um, for PCR testing, and a, a subsample for seroprevalence as well. So, um, and Spain did a really large um, nationally representative seroprevalence study. So we do have um, some good estimates, which I'll get to in the next slide. Um, but more broadly, in thinking about this infection fatality rate, there were also things that happened over the months that um, it looked like the infection fatality rate was coming down over time. And to a lot of people that, that meant that we were probably treating it better in the hospital. And I think there was, you know, we certainly did you know, learn how to treat it better um, to some degree, but um, I think the thing that all of us would naturally think about is that that denominator really is also changing over time. Um, not only did we have dramatic increases in testing um, that meant the case numbers from the first wave were really not comparable to what we were measuring later on, um, but especially after the first wave, the age distribution of cases really shifted a lot younger. 
Um, not surprisingly, the older and more vulnerable populations continued to, to shield themselves and, and take um, you know, more precautions. And when things opened up a bit in the summer in lots of places, the young people were, were the first ones to, to rush out and do things. So, so all of this was a way in which you know, really carefully thinking about um, you know, the numerator and the denominator was extremely important for inter interpreting something as fundamental as the infection fatality rate. Um, and one of the best um, meta-analysis that I've, or kind of uh, papers that tried to pull all this data together um, is this one that came out in October. Um, it used, it kind of assessed the, the quality of all these different national seroprevalence studies um, to get the best estimate of the infection fatality rate. And as you can see here, um, you know, as we were seeing early on, it really varied um, by age. So from something like 0.4% uh, at age 55, all the way to 15% at age 85. Um, and they were able to, to kind of quantify what, what we were suggesting very early on, that a lot of the, you know, if you're trying to get a single IFR for a country, um, you know, most of the difference in that is going to be explained um, by simply the age composition of the population. Um, so not only your overall population, but more importantly, the population that actually gets um, infected, obviously, will drive that number. Um, and I think it also points out how, you know, a single infection fatality rate is kind of a meaningless statistic when it varies so dramatically by age. Um, and this, um, so again, you know, especially in the, um, the science communication or the social media campaign that I'm a part of where we're um, trying to communicate a lot of COVID information for a general audience. And I'll, I'll talk more about that at the end. But, you know, one of the very early questions was, you know, is this really worse than the flu? Um, you know, some of it was, you know, misinformation and people trying to downplay the risks. But, you know, I think early on, these were legitimate questions about, um, you know, is this just a bad flu? Is it worth keeping my kids home from school, et cetera? And um, this was one of the, the first attempts to really compare that apples to apples with um, using those proper denominators from the seroprevalence study. So these red lines are all infection fatality rates for COVID estimated from some different um, seroprevalence studies as the denominator, and the blue lines are estimated um, infection fatality rate for the flu, um, you know, which also, as it turns out, is not that straightforward to calculate the denominator for, but we have a little more practice at, at trying to do that. Um, and you can see this is on the log scale. So um, the, you know, COVID is extremely, um, you know, more fatal than, than the flu for, for most ages. You have to get down, you know, to, to 20 years old or, or under for it to really, you know, start to be comparable to, to flu mortality. Um, and, and flu mortality is not something we take very lightly, although we don't shut down all of society. Um, but you can see that, you know, certainly for ages 30 and above, um, this is dramatically more risky than, than contracting the flu. And I think this was just really important to finally nail down and have some reliable estimates of um, what the infection fatality rate really was. Um, and again, yes, just to, and thank you whoever does all the good um, demography memes on Twitter. But um, I think it just, it, you know, looking at that, the steepness of that gradient really drives home the fact that one single mortality rate is, is really not meaningful in the context of COVID. You really need to think about who's getting infected and, you know, what the age structure of the population is that you're, you're measuring this in. So as, as the months went on, um, you know, I think, yeah, it's, it's, it seems like a million years ago as well, thinking back to last fall, but I don't know how many of you remember um, or were following the Great Barrington Declaration um, that came out in October. And this, um, if you missed it, was um, authored by, by three professors, uh, Martin Kuldorf, Sinetra Gupta, and Jay Bhattacharya. Um, somewhat hosted by the American Institute for Economic Research. Um, and they went to this grand estate in Great Barrington, possibly New Hampshire or Maine, I'm not sure. 
um, and had a champagne toast and, and signed this, this declaration. Um, the basic idea of which was that, um, you know, we should protect the, the older populations who are more vulnerable, um, something they called focus protection and let everyone else get, get back to their daily lives. And within six to eight weeks, you know, we'll reach herd immunity and, you know, kind of be done with the, the pandemic. Um, and so this was obviously controversial for a lot of reasons, but they, they got a lot of airplay on um, at least certain television channels. And they also, to be fair, you know, were really focused on um, the costs of lockdown and that there's a lot of indirect costs that I think we would all agree with as far as job loss and, and kids out of school and the stress and the mental health effects. So, so they were focusing on that and saying, we, sh you know, we should let most people get back to daily life and protect um, this older group. And um, I think um, for those of us who kind of took it as a, not a reasonable proposition, but thought that this was um, you know, trying to, to um, initiate some actual debate, um, both academic and policy debate, you know, the challenge of focus protection seemed really immense. I, again, going back to the, you know, high degree of intergenerational contact in some societies, but really in any society, it's going to be very difficult to cordon off um, those 65 and older. And the truth is it's not a sharp, um, you know, threshold at age 65. There still can be a lot of um, morbidity under age 65. Um, and the authors of this declaration gave very few details on how one would effectively um, carry out this focus protection. Um, and so that was, that was a bit frustrating for some of us that tried to engage. So I participated um, as one of the authors in a response to this, which was called the John Snow Memorandum. Um, and we just outlined some, some rebuttals to, to the points they were making. Again, not, not advocating lockdowns, but just suggesting that this herd immunity approach was actually um, you know, really, really dangerous. And some of the thought exercises, oh, sorry, I should have, have shown this. Um, this was the crux of their, their hypothesis, um, was that those who were not immediately vulnerable um, should be allowed to resume life as normal. Um, and they really did hinge this all on that the fact that this would not be very dangerous to, to younger people. And so it would build up um, population or herd immunity. And so, you know, taking them um, at their word, we, we kind of wanted to at least um, do some back of the envelope on what this might look like in a best case scenario. And again, this was not very, you know, this was all happening in a matter of a few weeks, these discussions. And so, um, you know, this was, this was happening in, in letters and, and short pieces. Um, and so it was, it was really interesting to see this um, unfold. It was sort of, there was no time for kind of six months of peer review um, to work some of these ideas out. Um, but one thing we just looked at really quickly was, you know, the idea of, you know, what would happen if you tried to carry out this focus protection for those um, over age 65, um, because you're trying to not infect those over age 65 at high risk of mortality, we assumed you'd have to reach um, an even higher level of immunity in the under 65s. Um, so we just are playing around with some assumptions here of 80%. Um, and at the age specific in infection fatality rates that we had um, in the US at the time, you know, even getting 80% of the under 65s infected would have um, you know, been equated to 357,000 deaths um, only for those age under 65. And of course, you know, you'd think even if we're doing our best at focus protection, whatever that might be, um, there's bound to be some spillover. So, you know, even if 10% of over 65s um, got infected um, in this kind of let it, let it rip and reach herd immunity scenario, um, that would almost be an additional 400,000 deaths over age 65. Um, and so this was, and this was also in October before we'd kind of all reached these numbers of hundreds of thousands of deaths. Um, but we were just, you know, suggesting that in this best case scenario, um, there would still be a staggering number of expected deaths um, to reach the herd immunity 
through natural infection and um, almost half of them would be under age 65. And of course, the number of hospitalizations, ICU admissions, et cetera, would have been many multiples of this. And if it was supposed to happen in a short time frame, as suggested, um, it would have been extremely overwhelming to hospitals. Um, and uh, you know, one of our other critiques of the general idea was that there was no acknowledgement that there were any dangers to, to younger people at all. Um, and of course, um, there's a lot to be researched about long COVID. I think there's a real lack of um, you know, well-designed studies about it, but um, in, the, in the UK where we are doing the random, the random testing and population representative samples, um, there is um, uh, a decent prevalence of people who have symptoms even after 12 weeks after testing positive. So um, just to say, if you're infecting the entire country, that would add up to a lot of people with potentially debilitating long COVID symptoms. Um, so this was um, an interesting um, experience for me, again, that some of this, um, you know, I, some of these people really did have the ear of policymakers, especially, um, you know, Trump and Scott Atlas in the U.S., but even Sunetra Gupta met with um, Boris Johnson here. So, um, you know, the, the stakes seemed really high for some of these discussions, and it was really not driven by anything empirical on, on the other side, um, which was, it was really interesting to me to think about and um, to experience and, and ultimately to realize that I don't think that that particular group of people wanted to have a genuine um, debate about um, the merits of these different potential approaches. Um, and so that was, you know, I sort of naively thought that might be the case. I think in the end, that was not the case, but um, I think it was interesting um, to realize that, especially the research we all do as social scientists, so one of their motivations were the costs of lockdown, as I said, um, were so high um, with respect to unemployment and lost education, et cetera. And that should be an area where we you know, are really able to contribute what we do know about all of those. Um, you know, the, we know a lot about the health impacts of all of those things. It's what a lot of us study all the time. So um, it was an area where I think, you know, we should have all been um, ready to jump in for these types of policy debates. Um, but, you know, we can't always account for who gets all of the media attention, unfortunately. Um, so that was the Great Barrington Declaration, and we can talk more about that later, but, you know, shortly thereafter, just in early November is when the phase three results from Pfizer came out with incredible efficacy. Um, and you would think that having an effective vaccine would kind of put to rest that we should, we should go really quickly for natural herd immunity, but um, I think that was another sign that it wasn't a genuine conversation is that that didn't seem to change their perspective very much. So that was interesting. Um, but I wanted to switch back to um, another just realm where I think demography was really important, again, in quantifying the mortality burden of, of the pandemic. And as I said, you know, people were at the beginning trying to figure out if this was worse than the flu. Um, but um, and during pandemic, we were answering a lot of questions. Um, you know, this was a bit of a myth and misinformation, but I think again, it was also a legitimate question. The idea of are we overcounting deaths? Um, so you guys probably heard, you know, some politicians suggesting that doctors had incentives to put COVID on the death certificate, even if they came in with a motorcycle accident or something. Um, there were lots of kind of myths and misinformation circulating about that. But I think more legitimately, people thought, well, if this is really striking older people, you know, who often have a lot of comorbidities, is it possible that all of these people, you know, many of these people might have died anyway, and we're just counting them as COVID. And this was, you know, I think that's a very legitimate question. And of course, demography does have a kind of a powerful tool for trying to assess that, which is excess mortality. And that means we're not relying on what's coded on the death certificate. We're looking at mortality from all causes um, and basically saying, are we seeing more than we would have expected um, from what you know, happened in the last few years? And that can be a simple average of the last few years, but you know, demographers also have some modeling techniques to account for 
how the population is changing, et cetera. But I think it turned out that this idea was very intuitive to people that, no, we're looking at all deaths above and beyond what would have been expected. Um, and at least on our Facebook page, this actually resonated with people and they felt like, oh, that, that makes a lot of sense. And now I can explain this to my um, you know, conspiracy theory um, uncle a bit, um, that it's not just that we're overcounting these deaths and counting every, every single death as COVID. Um, and so I think that's been a really powerful um, insight that, um, you know, at least, you know, gave people a picture of what was going on. And all of a sudden we see excess mortality figures in the New York Times and The Economist and all sorts of places. Um, and I think it's been a really effective way to communicate that um, burden. And this picture was from The New York Times back from the first wave in the U.S. And I really liked it because, you know, I think for all of us, one of the things that will be important to unpack is, you know, how much of excess mortality was direct deaths due to COVID that were not, um, that were not coded as such, because especially early on with the lack of testing or people not going to the hospital um, and how much might be indirect um, effects due to the lockdown, due to lock, I mean, not just lockdowns, but restrictions everything else that came along with the pandemic. Some of that could have been foregone, you know, healthcare and screening and being afraid to go to the hospital for a heart attack. Um, but some of it, you know, could be sort of longer, you know, I think there'll be many longer term indirect effects. Um, and this, I think, just really struck me early on um, and kind of convinces me that a lot of the excess mortality probably is direct deaths due to COVID. Um, because at least across the US, the excess mortality really tracked the path of the virus itself across time and space. So at least last spring, a lot of places across the country were under restrictions, um, even if the virus wasn't you know, terribly bad where they were locally. Um, but we can see that the excess mortality was really concentrated in the Northeast and then kind of moved across the country um, into the summer. So um, again, it's just suggestive to me that a lot of that is direct effects of, of COVID, but um, I'm hoping that um, kind of leveraging the differences in the movement of the, the virus across time and space across everywhere will be one of the ways in which we can untangle this in the long run. And this is another picture from the Financial Times, I think, showing how excess mortality has played out um, across the world. Um, I guess these are a little dated now, but um, again, it really, I just think makes it easy for people to see what's been going on and where, you know, especially you can see that this is happening again with the path of the virus itself. Um, it's not just due to lockdowns. Um, and you can see, you know, how Latin America has been incredibly hard hit, et cetera. Um, and it's, it's again become one of these omnipresent ways of, of looking at mortality data, um, thanks to demographers. So moving on to, to later in the pandemic, I think a more recent um, contribution of the demographic perspective has been thinking about vaccination prioritization. Um, and this has been really interesting for me because it's played out differently in the UK versus the US and it's been very interesting to watch. Um, so as you, this is a, a figure of the priority list for vaccinations in the UK. And I think the, the deaths that they're citing here were from the initial wave. Um, so probably not what happened in the fall and winter here in the UK. But you can see that 93% of the deaths here were in um, ages over 65. And this really did inform um, a policy of very strict age prioritization of vaccinations here in the UK. Um, it, it really has, and because of the NHS, you know, to be fair, it's also been much easier to carry out a very um, systematic rollout um, where people just kind of get a message that their appointment is happening um, and, and they go do it. Um, but so one interesting thing uh, compared to the US is that the US actually has had a sort of shift in the, the age distribution of deaths. Um, it, they are occurring at 
slightly younger ages, I think the equivalent number is that 80% of deaths in the COVID deaths in the US have been over age 65. So, so that is one interesting difference. Um, but still in the US, um, you know, the, the initial recommendations coming out from some of the advisory panels were to consider age, but also to think about occupation and all these other risk factors. And then you guys can tell me how it's actually played out, but it has seemed to be a bit, um, you know, chaotic that it, it's kind of started out with healthcare workers and um, so kind of older people, but then became a bit of a free for all and, and who could manage the internet the best. Um, so I, it did in fact play out very differently um, in the UK versus the US. Um, and this is a, um, somebody put together a just quick figure of, of how this would play out in the UK if that you could cover, you could avoid a lot of the deaths based on this prioritization schedule, you know, by only, um, you know, vaccinating a small percentage of the population. So, so this was one of the, the justifications for this strongly age-based prioritization. Um, and I think this is related to the debate also about delaying second doses, um, for which the UK and the US also took very different approaches. Um, so I realize not everyone might be following um, all of these things as much as I was. So just to recap um, this issue, obviously supply was you know, very constrained of vaccines when they were first coming out. And in both the UK and the US, December, January were really, really high, you know, levels of transmission, um, extremely um, rampant and dangerous levels of, of transmission. So a lot of people um, at risk of infection and death. And the UK decided to um, try to maximize the number of people who would have a first dose by um, increasing the interval between first and second doses to up to 12 weeks. Um, and this was raised, you know, as well in the U.S. in the early rollout. Um, and I don't have any insight into the decision-making processes at different levels, but it was pretty quickly dismissed. Um, and a lot of the justification, so the justification for the one dose is that um, it looks like one dose um, of the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines were quite effective even after two or three weeks at preventing especially serious disease and death. Um, but of course the trials were designed um, to give the second dose after three or four weeks. Um, and so, you know, a lot of these policy decision makers in the US and at the CDC were kind of from a clinical um, lab perspective and kind of, kind of the, the bottom line was we can't deviate from what the clinical trial did. Um, and I, you know, I talking to other colleagues also who were kind of from this more clinical perspective, they just, they couldn't even fathom that you would do something not, you know, not the way it was carried out in the trial. And um, it struck me how interesting that was because they, they really couldn't even see the implications for this um, population level policy of trying to protect the most people in the shortest amount of time. And that, you know, if you, um, I mean, it's not this simple and there's legitimate debates about, um, you know, I, I'll say there's legitimate debates about the policy, even, even for population scholars. But, but, you know, the general idea is if you have, you know, two doses, or yeah, you have two doses and both your grandma and grandpa in front of you, are you going to, um, and raging transmission, um, a fire around you, are you going to give, you know, one dose to each or two doses uh, just to one person. And, and that's sort of that idea writ large. And um, so I think, first of all, I think there, you know, these things should have been worked into the trials. And it's also something that only struck me um, after the fact was that there were really no um, population or social scientists thinking about what we needed to learn from the, from the clinical trials. So the, it, you know, it turns out the three to four week intervals were really meant to get the trials, to get maximum protection in the shortest amount of time to get the trial done, but they were not meant to kind of test the optimal dosing. And there was reason to believe that longer intervals um, immunologically would be actually um, probably a good thing, but it wasn't even, you know, put into any of the trials. And I feel like if we had just thought a few months ahead, it would have been obvious that 
this type of question would be really, really important for the rollout, you know, not just in our countries, but globally. Um, and it's a shame that that wasn't um, incorporated in the planning and trials in the first place, as well as some other things like we actually didn't test, you know, whether the vaccines reduce transmission in the trials. And I think all of us, you know, are thinking that would have been really easy to put in a little household, you know, survey um, for people participating in the trial. Did anyone in your family get sick over this time period? Um, but I'm in a trial, um, I was in one of the trials here in the UK and, you know, we had a little app to fill out twice a week, just if we had COVID symptoms, but, you know, not a single question about anybody in my household. Um, and obviously that seems like a, a really big loss opportunity in retrospect. Um, so, so to sum up, so the UK has taken this delayed second dose approach while the US um, did not. And it's obviously not the only thing that's differed between the UK and the US um, because the UK went into lockdown, um, also did the strict age prioritization. Um, but I think you know, these were months of really high transmission and I think the, you know, the stakes were really high and we're gonna have to take stock of, of how that played out in the end. Um, and this is showing how that gap really did open up. So the US has started to catch up a bit um, to, to their credit, but you can see that during you know, January and February, um, when there was still a lot of virus around um, in both countries, that there really was a big gap opening up in um, the percentage of the population that had at least one dose in the UK versus the US. The US would look much better on who has been fully vaccinated, um, to be fair. And indeed, again, the UK was in lockdown, you know, pretty extreme lockdown. So it's um, hard to make a direct comparison, but the UK, the US death levels, you know, really did stagnate at quite a high level for, for you know, a long time. So way, way above 500 a day, um, which I can't believe we just got used to, to 500 people a day um, dying. And, it, and they're really just starting to now come down um, to lower levels. So um, again, I think it'll be worth going back and seeing, um, doing some counterfactuals of these different vaccine strategies and how that might have played out differently. Um, and demographers have indeed um, been contributing to this. Again, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, it'll be really interesting to try to understand how these policy decisions were made because I'm not sure that demographers were in on those important conversations in the US, but um, Josh Goldstein and um, Ken Wachter and, and Thomas Cassidy wrote a paper um, kind of illustrating the, the fact that age prioritization would, um, you know, a vaccination would save both the most number of lives as well as years of life lost. Because um, obviously it could be that saving the lives of slightly younger people um, in some cases saves more um, total years of life. Um, um, but in this case, because the age gradient is so steep for COVID, um, it ends up being the optimal strategy for both um, absolute numbers of lives and the years of life lost. Um, and this was, you know, there were a lot of assumptions in this, um, but they're kind of basically bringing home this point that, that age prioritization um, is, is a really optimal strategy. Um, but to counter that a little bit, there was um, a recent paper by Elizabeth Wrigley Field and colleagues that um, really tried to integrate the fact that that age distribution of deaths is shifted, um, especially for ethnic minorities in the US. Um, so here you can see what these survival proportion of COVID deaths um, by age look like for different race ethnicities. Um, in California and Minnesota, where I think they had some good local level data. Um, and they, again, ran some simulations then showing that taking this into account, you could minimize uh, mortality um, by a vaccination prioritization um, strategy that took into account um, area level um, deprivation. So not targeting individuals by race, but targeting areas um, based on, on the composition of those um, local areas. And that that would be the mortality minimizing strategy 
um, in contrast to just a strict age prioritization, which in some ways favors um, whites who are mostly dying um, at the older ages. So there's been just some really interesting work that I think is extremely policy relevant. Again, you know, the stakes for getting this right were extremely high. And um, even if we missed some opportunities this time around, I think it's gonna be really important that we reflect on all of this and, and try to write the playbook. Um, I hope there's not a next time anytime soon, but I just, I think it would be a real, a real loss if we don't try to learn um, from this experience and what we wish we had known um, a little bit earlier. So I think this was really great work by Elizabeth Wrigley Field. Um, and finally, I wanted to, to sh not finally, um, I have a little bit more on Dear Pandemic, but finally um, for the de demography part, I wanted to just show some, some recent results on what COVID has done to life expectancy during in 2020. Um, this is a preprint with some of my colleagues at my center. And um, obviously the data you know, is still coming in from a lot of countries, but, and I think we've got more countries um, that we've added recently, um, but we wanted to take stock of, of what COVID seemed to have done to life expectancy in, in countries that had good data so far. Um, so we used harmonized data by age and sex from the human mortality database. Um, and um, we did you know, some disaggregation by looking at the, the ages that contributed to life expectancy losses. Um, and also for some countries, how much of that loss was attributable directly to registered COVID deaths. I'm just gonna show you um, some, some basic results because there's a, yeah, a lot of countries and a lot of different ways to look at this. Um, so, so the bottom line here is, um, the dots on the left, which are for males and females, are showing the, the loss in life expectancy for 2020. And on the right, the little hash lines are the average yearly change from 2015 to 2019 to try to get a sense of kind of the magnitude of this mortality shock. Um, and so we showed that, that females in seven countries and males in 11 countries lost um, in excess of one year of life expectancy at birth. Um, which uh, to put into perspective is a magnitude of loss not seen since World War II in most countries or the breakdown of the Soviet Union in Eastern Europe. And sadly, the biggest losses of 1.5 years or more um, were among males in the US, Bulgaria, Poland, and Sweden, and females in the US and Spain. Um, and so it, it really is um, a pretty dramatic um, drop um, and looking at the different ages that contributed to this decline in life expectancy, um, of course, for many countries, this was concentrated um, in the deaths at, at very old ages. Um, but it's interesting that in a country like the US that was hit particularly hard, um, the impact of mortality under age 60 was quite noticeable um, in its contribution to the loss in life expectancy. Um, so, so males below age 60 in the U.S. contributed the most to decreased life expectancy um, bet between 2019 and 2020. Um, and, and this was really, you know, trying to just describe what's happened, but I think for all of us um, population health scholars, there's going to be some really important questions going forward about um, you know, what's, what's kind of impact is COVID going to have on population health um, for decades and, and cohorts to come, you know, what kind of um, imprints will this have? Um, and life expectancy, I think, um, you know, it was, so one thing we experienced again in, in releasing this preprint and, and describing it on Twitter was that, um, you know, general audiences don't really have an intuitive sense of what life expectancy means. Um, we know it's a period measure. Um, that helps to kind of standardize and quantify, you know, health shocks. And so we can kind of interpret it that way. But there was actually a clinician who wrote a piece that went viral when the CDC life expectancy figures came out that said, this is really deceptive to say COVID has dropped life expectancy by um, two years because COVID's not going to happen every year of someone's life. 
And of course that's true, but life expectancy is never, you know, we never release life expectancy measures at, for what happens to an actual individual. So it was an interesting experience for me to realize that um, this is not a very intuitive measure and is it the best way for us to be conveying this, uh, the magnitude of this mortality shock. Um, and another example was someone who wrote um, because our initial framing of, of this preprint was that, um, that we reversed all of the gains from 2015 to 2019 um, due to COVID. And so someone said, but, so this means that life expectancy is what it was in 2015. That's not so bad. Why did we you know, shut down society, um, et cetera? And so it, you know, it was really interesting to try to explain that um, you know, the idea that this loss in life expectancy was really concentrated in a, in a small group of people for one thing, and also to clarify how it compared to huge shocks like World War II, et cetera, um, you know, to try to really convey that to people. But I think it's, it's an interesting thing for us all to think about of whether life expectancy is a good way to convey this um, idea to the general public. Um, Obviously looking forward 2021 is not looking so great with respect to mortality in many countries. So I think there'll still be um, a, you know, a serious direct impact of COVID for 2021. Um, we'll have to see how vaccines and, and all the new variants play out globally. Um, but as I was saying earlier, I think this is where we're gonna start to see you know, perhaps the impact of all this delayed healthcare seeking screenings and treatments. Um, that's something that, uh, that could take quite a while to, to play out. Um, I'm also kind of interested in thinking about the scarring effects. Um, obviously this can be a very serious illness for many people who survive, especially the elderly. Um, you know, so thinking about you know, what type of health are we gonna see um, for those who did not die, but were seriously ill, not only long COVID, but just you know, the effects of hospitalization and, and kind of trajectories of frailty and disability in the elderly. Um, but obviously this may be countered a little bit by a selection effect of um, you know, if, if it is the most frail who have on average died, um, then there might be slightly better health of those who survived. Um, and finally, the, the area that, again, I think so many of, of us in, in demography and social science will be looking into are the long-term impacts on health of the social and economic crises associated with the pandemic. And there will just be so much um, to unpack there, I think. And you know, we are still writing papers on the 1918 flu pandemic. So um, I'm, I know not everyone wants to research COVID all the time, but I think it's obvious that this is going to be um, an extremely important life course exposure for, for almost everything that we all study going forward. So, so my take home message, again, um, kind of, yeah, preaching to the choir, I guess it's kind of like a pep rally, but just to say, um, from my experience in lots of different realms this year, demography has been really, really important for understanding the pandemic in, in some really fundamental ways. Um, and part of that is because a pandemic really is a population, um, not an individual level problem. Um, and now I, I know that some you know, specialties like immunology and virology and even epidemiology had um, got a lot of attention this year, but um, I think you know, demography um, will continue to kind of have um, a golden age in, in understanding all that's happened. Um, and it really is more important than ever to have this population perspective and think about implications um, in a very um, multidisciplinary way. So, you know, there's some, you know, snarky things uh, here and there that, you know, people who aren't infectious disease specialists shouldn't weigh in on the pandemic. And I'll just say it really is, you know, it's a multidisciplinary problem. And um, so our voices are important and definitely needed um, in a time like this. So, so don't feel that you have to stay in your own lane. So finally, just as kind of a coda, I wanted to, to tell you all about the, the social media science communication campaign that I've been a part of. Um, we're called Dear Pandemic, but an early follower called us, uh, said they would trust anything those nerdy girls have to say. And so that became our, our nickname. 
Um, and this also started very haphazardly in March 2020 when um, some of us who work in public health were getting questions from family and friends about all sorts of things. You know, should I wash down my groceries and is my dog going to give me COVID? Um, and so we created a Facebook group. Um, so the first two people were Allison Buttenheim and Malia Jones, both um, from alumna of your center. And they quickly recruited several more of us um, to help out with this Facebook page. And it really kind of took off from there. Um, and the real idea was to help people manage, you know, the, the really overwhelming amount of information that was coming out and trying to be, um, trying to be, you know, some, something of a curator of information of kind of picking out what was important and also trying to dispel misinformation and myths that were going around. Um, so that was, you know, the basic mission and it really has grown um, a lot over time um, and really just been a huge eye opener for me and, and how to try to communicate these scientific ideas to a general population and also really get a sense of what, um, you know, people are worried about in their everyday lives during this pandemic. Um, and so we saw our work really fitting into the, a bit to this idea of the infodemic that the WHO um, has declared, again, that it's not always necessarily misinformation, but just an overabundance of information that kind of overwhelms people's ability to take it in. Um, and so we were trying to help um, distill what was important. Uh, we have three, Facebook was really our main, main platform. Again, it was meant originally to communicate with family and friends, um, but it turned out you know, to be a really you know, useful way to share information. So a lot of people would share, share our posts and Facebook is a, an easy way to do that. So um, we know that a lot of misinformation spreads on social media and Facebook, but we thought better that we kind of try to attack it on its own turf. Um, and turn the weapons of, of social media against itself a little bit and get the good information out there. We also have, an, um, we kind of translate that same content into Instagram and Twitter as well. Um, and we also have a web page that then has, um, you know, an archive of all our past posts that you can search for, for lots of different topics. Um, and we also have a Spanish language mirror site um, called Querida Pandemia that's, that's been growing. There seems to be a real lack of, of good information um, in, in Spanish. So I think this is um, a really uh, still, you know, and especially as the pandemic is not even close to over in, in many parts of Latin America, um, this is something that we want to continue to focus on going forward. Um, it's been really interesting to see what um, topics were, were um, popular over the months, you know, very early on, anything about masks and herd immunity. But as I said, also this issue of overcounting or undercounting deaths was actually um, really important. And of course, now we're practically all vaccines all the time. Um, but besides just translating the, the actual information and science, we also have tried to give people tools um, to better interpret this information for themselves, but also to have conversations um, with their family and friends. And, and so we do, um, we kind of call it the info de infodemiology beat, um, trying to give people um, some strategies, especially if they really do want to talk to family and friends who um, believe in conspiracy theories or are you know vaccine hesitant, whatever it might, might be. So um, this is another one of our goals. As kind of broader science education. Um, and there's been, you know, all sorts of questions under the sun. We sh I think we're going to try to write a paper with our, just from our question box alone. Um, but what's been fascinating is that, you know, to learn that people really do need help at assessing risk um, has been one big lesson. People really don't know how to think about or evaluate um, risks, and they, they really often want us to absolve them from a decision, you know, they want us to say that, you know, they'll ask, is this safe or is this not safe? You know, is it safe to do X, Y, or Z? And they want us to say yes or no. And so a lot of what we've had to do is educate about risk being much more of a continuum and not, not you know, not a light switch that you can flip um, on and off. Um, and one example of, of the risk that was particularly salient most recently were 
um, these blood clotting issues around um, AstraZeneca and the Johnson and Johnson vaccines. Um, so prior to that, I had been really aware of the fact, you know, in December and January that if we were going to vaccinate millions and millions of people, um, you know, bad stuff was going to happen within a short time frame for some of those people just by chance. And so we, we kind of tried to inoculate, in a sense, our, our followers to understand that, that if, you know, just because something happens right after the vaccine does not mean that it was due to the vaccine. And you have to look at whether this is an elevated rate compared to what we would expect. Um, and so when the AstraZeneca blood clot news first came out, um, I kind of came back with this message that, you know, it looks like the overall rates are not elevated. So, you know, we shouldn't get too worked up. Um, and then as more information came out um, that, you know, there did seem to be a signal here with this very rare type of um, specific blood clot, um, you know, I had to think about how to come back and then communicate um, that actually there might be something going on here, but we still need to put that risk in perspective. And I found this, um, you know, there were lots of different infographics making the rounds, but um, this was one from a center um, here in the UK that tried to put these risks um, in, in context of actually catching COVID by age and your chance of ICU admission. Um, and I think this was, you know, just a really helpful way to get people um, to, to put that risk in context. And so that's a lot of what we do is, is try to help people think through that none of these risks are completely safe or completely unsafe that you have to, you know, kind of figure out what you know, what trade-offs you're willing to make in between. And that turns out to be really, really hard for people. Um, so overall, it's been a wild ride. There's a lot more I could talk about here, but um, we really have had a great interdisciplinary crew. We've got immunologists, nurses, demographers, um, and you know, we really do try to communicate to people that it doesn't have to be perfect, you know, getting a little bit better at reducing your risk is, is still important. And then um, I didn't dwell on this too much, but we really think because we've been kind of communicating with people directly for over 15 months now that we have built up um, quite a level of trust and, and personal connection. And so that when we do have important things to communicate about new breaking news and, or vaccines, that um, our followers um, really do seem to trust what we say. And that was something we kind of didn't realize we were building, but it's something we wanna capitalize on and, and hopefully continue um, this type of education going forward. So yeah, feel free if you haven't um, found us already to, to follow us. We, you know, I know it feels like the pandemic's coming to an end a bit in the US. It's obviously still going um, strong in lots of places. So, so we've made a commitment to not go anywhere for a while and ultimately hope to transition to a, you know, more general, um, science and health topics, um, that may not be pandemic related, but we're going to, we're going to stick around as those nerdy girls, um, even post pandemic. So I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jen. That was, Really, um, you've been very busy this past year, that's for <laughs> sure. Uh, so let's open it up for questions. Well, I'll the, take any, any pandemic questions I'll take too. <laughs> well, well let, me, let me start with, with the, your last point. Um, and that is uh, how, uh, do you have a strategy for getting people to come to your website or come 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 to your your um, to your offerings? Because it strikes me that a lot of people who need you uh, yeah. don't know about you or or might be resistant to even coming. So what are you, what are you doing about that? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question that we've. Um, We've struggled with because at the beginning it was just organic growth where you know people would share with their family and friends and um, I think there's still a lot of it. A lot of our follower growth would come um, 
especially from posts that really went viral if we were debunking some particular myth um, that would get, again, if a post gets shared a lot, then I think, you know, it does create this social network effect where all of the friends of whoever shares it um, might see it and decide to follow us. So I think it's true that most of our natural followers would be people kind of receptive to these ideas anyway, but we, I guess we saw that ability to resonate out to have those people be kind of carriers of that information into their communities. And, and we get so many um, emails and feedback about, I did use this in my clinic to talk to my patients. I use this, you know, I'm a nurse and I use it or, um, or I've convinced my, you know, someone in my family. So, you know, it is a bit challenging to think that we're going to recruit all types of people to follow those nerdy girls um, on a daily basis, but we're kind of hoping that we're creating um, these trusted messengers who can take it out into their broader communities. Um, and as far as outreach, we felt like Querida Pandemia was, was also one. Um, so that was kind of spearheaded by Sandra Albrecht, who's um, got a lot of family in Latin America and in Queens and really wanted to reach those communities. Um, and I think that that need um, is still really unmet. So we're trying to grow there. Um, and we were actually also contacted by Facebook Social Impact um, group. And they're, we're just starting, they're starting to help us like boost our posts and try different audiences. Um, they can actually test like whether your post changes someone's attitude on something. They can do these um, uh, studies embedded within their system and they're encouraging us to try to do that more scientifically and design things that we might want to test with different audiences. So that's something without the money, we didn't have the real ability to try to boost it to different audiences and see what type of messages appealed, but it's something that hopefully we're going to be able to do going forward. But we also tried to stay as non, we call it nonpartisan as possible, especially when so much was revolving around Trump last year, we didn't call out particular politicians because we didn't want it to become polarized in that way. We wanted, we wanted to be able to people to feel comfortable from, from across the political spectrum. And I'm sure it still definitely leans, um, leans to the left in our following, but, but we try to be as inclusive to kind of get the messages where they might be needed most. But um, that's a, yeah, that's a really interesting long-term challenge because sometimes I do wonder if I'm just preaching to the choir all the time, but we have enough, um, I think, stories of how it's, it, the, the reach has gotten out where, where it really has a lot of impact. So that keeps us going, but yeah, it's a really excellent question. So we've got a question in chat from Atsushi. Atsushi, do you want to read your question? Ah, uh, yes. So in UK, how have the government reflected the findings and insights about the demographic aspects of COVID-19 impact as you presented in the policy? So I, I wonder whether there is opportunity where the government systemically accepts the uh, experts policy recommendations? Yeah, that that's a great question. I think I'm sure we'll all also be learning a lot about um, what was going on behind, behind the curtain um, after the fact. There was just some big hearing that I haven't watched yet in the UK that you might have seen in the news of um, one of the cabinet ministers kind of throwing everyone else under the bus about some of these decisions. So I think there's been plenty of controversy here about how this was handled. Um, but actually the director of my center, Melinda Mills, um, has, has been on a lot of these. So they have SAGE committees, which are advising the government on a lot of these policies. Um, and she's on kind of the social and behavioral science one. They've been meeting all the time and she does get to kind of present um, to some of the um, the ministers in Downing Street and in Parliament. Um, so I felt like there has been, you know, without knowing very well what's going on in the US, I have felt like there's at least um, communication going on from the social and, and population scientists, um, you know, how that feeds into the actual decisions being made um, is a good question. 
um, the vaccination decisions, you know, that that was an immunization advisory committee. I, again, I don't know the inner workings of how they came to those conclusions. Um, you know, when you would read it, it sounded really obvious. They're just like, this just makes sense to delay the second dose and get the more, you know, twice as many people a first dose. Um, there wasn't as lot of, as much deliberation about it here. Um, so I think there is a real effort to get the voices of academics, but like anywhere, it's it's been very politicized at the same time. Um, but I really do want us all to think about a playbook for future pandemics, God forbid. But um, we there were just so many opportunities, I think, for us to to you know anticipate some of these questions um, earlier, and then we definitely need policy people to help us you know figure out what happened and how we can. Um, get our voices heard next time. Thank you, Patrick. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, um, James. Thank you, um, Jennifer, for your presentation and all the work that uh, you and your group has done. The, the science is amazing. And also, what's amazing is that you got your into the arena and tried to explain this to uh, journalists and the public, and um, I've doubled, doubled a little bit in that, and I know it's exhausting, so I'm, I'm very impressed by all you, you've done. I have an observation about um, the comments you said you receive about the, the returning to 2015 life expectancy and um, what I heard also in the sense of, you know, all that for that, you know, it wasn't such a big deal. Yeah, I was hoping um, it would and, happen. Yeah, and my observation, I mean, I have, it's twofold. I mean, the first, the first one is to say, think about the money that it took to get us from 2015 to 2020 life expectancy, all the um, investment in, you know, basic science on cancer and medical intervention and public health messages. And, and so this is huge, actually. So if we, if we had kind of wasted that money, uh, I think that's not a small um, chicken feed. But the, the other thing is, uh, because I, I also heard the comparison with the flu. So it's like, okay, it's several times a regular flu season. So it's, it's big, but it's not that huge. Yes, well, it is because we did all this. And in spite of doing all this, all this lockdown and this, we still had several times the flu because we, as we've seen uh, the past uh, winter with this, uh, with the lockdown and the mask, we basically got rid of the flu, right? So um, the fact that in spite of all this, we still have something that is several times what a, a normal flu epidemic is, that's, that's impressive. You just have to think of, well, you did some simulation on you know, the, if we, if we had tried to reach herd immunity. And um, I mean, the, the death toll would be several times what it is. So, in, so, so the point is not, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's kind of um, unfair to look at the effect after we did all this and say, well, we didn't have to do all this. Well, if we didn't, it would be a completely different picture. So the fact that it's still that high, I mean, you know, half a million people and, and, and more in the US, that's, that's a staggering number for given all that we did to try to, to limit it. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. I, cause you do hear people still say, well, lockdowns didn't work and masks don't work because we had all of this, um, we still had all this mortality and I'm, yeah, it shocks me that people can't, can't think, well, what would the counterfactual have been with no mitigation whatsoever? It would have been a lot worse. Um, so yeah, I, that's a really important point. And, and maybe we'll have some lessons about, yeah, whether we want to live with the levels of flu, flu deaths that we had in the past, if we, if we know that, you know, hopefully simpler mitigation, but perhaps we can, we can settle on a lower baseline for that as well. So yeah, no, it's a great point. People want to kind of anchor it somehow and try to understand how bad this is, but they're not really thinking about the worst case scenario versus what we're, what we're doing now. That's a good point. All right, so I, I've got a, a, just one question for you, which is more maybe reflective about the past year. And I'd like to hear just a couple points about, you know, doing demography in real time. Right. I mean, generally, we don't produce things so quickly. We are so much more. I mean, when I want someone to double check my figures, I go to a demographer because I know you guys will take your time. You'll really, you know, look at these things carefully. So I'd love to hear a little bit about kind of the, the, the benefits and maybe some of the pitfalls of sending these things out right away, including your experience with preprint, preprints. Yeah. 
Yeah, this was just a, a whole new world. And uh, I mean, to be honest, it was a bit scary to put something out there. And then, you know, I think just because of the timing last March, um, when we tweeted about our preprint, it literally went crazy. And I had not spent a lot of time on Twitter before. Um, and I suddenly was really scared that we had messed something up. Um, but I think I think I I think it was absolutely necessary. I don't know what we would have done without preprints in this pandemic. Like, you know, there was no time to wait for the publication process. Um, so even though it meant that a lot of garbage started coming out, I felt like the kind of public real time peer review was actually quite good. Um, that if if something came out that was a bit sensational in preprint. You know, this, the bad thing was it could immediately be picked up by journalists and which you know, I think is, is more dangerous than the normal slow pace. Um, but, you know, people were all over bad scholarship right away. Um, and you could, you could very quickly get some really good critiques, like really detailed critiques of, of anything um, important that was coming out. So, so I'm actually a fan. I'm sure there was definitely, there's going to be an error rate. People are going to mess up. But I also think people were um, understanding and hopefully it also contributed to kind of the open science thing. So I know with our life expectancy paper, that wasn't exactly timely like a vaccine paper, but um, there was some kind of data glitch and someone spotted it and told us and we had our code. And, and so that sort of feedback could happen really quickly as well, which I think um, was great. So um, I think for me, kind of during that period where there was just a lot of weird things um, with that, with the Great Barrington Declaration, it became obvious that we do have to find some different means of getting our stuff out there. Like, like an academic paper wasn't appropriate. And, but when you try to find venues to publish like a little short blog or a you know, more like what we're doing on Dear Pandemic, like a post or a blog. Um, you don't really, I don't think we know where to go to communicate our stuff in that way. And so that was, you know, that was something that, that um, I saw maybe as something we should find, um, maybe some more pol policy briefs or something that we have a way to get our stuff out there. Like, I don't think demography, like, nobody thought of publishing and demography when you were trying to get something out that week, <laughs> you know, like just, uh, but maybe we should think about, you know, some mechanism for that when there is a, a crisis that, that we can use our forums to get that out. Um, but in general, yeah, I, there's definitely been a lot of bad stuff coming out in preprint, but I think the truth is we can all, we actually are good at reading something and assessing its quality at the end of the day. So, um, but we will probably mess up a lot more when we're rushing to do things for sure. Thank you so much. Uh, we just have another couple minutes. Last minute questions. Well, if there is no other uh, question, maybe I can just jump in again. Uh, sorry to for taking a, a second uh, turn, but um, on on what Jennifer just said. It, with demography journal, so I, I did submit a piece to a demography journal that I'm not going to name, but and the answer from the editors were, well, this is still developing. Why don't you wait until we have better data on this and publish the definitive piece on on um, you know life expectancy reductions and, and and excess mortality and causes of death and all that, which you know I, I can understand. I mean, what they I think what they would like to have is the piece that will be the final say on thing and be maybe uh, cited in in five years, ten years as the reference uh, article. They're not really interested in having this kind of first estimate. Look, this is where what's going on right now, and maybe we'll get it wrong, which is the risk. I mean, you were, Jim James was talking about the, the risk. I mean, the risk is that you you get it wrong. You you're a little bit off, but at least you can. Um, you're more in the uh, alert mode, or were you trying to signal to the community that there's something that is really going on? And so the two, I think, have some values, but I agree that our journals are not equipped for that right now. And I think a lot of the, the work has been published in, in public health journal, in, in uh, PNAS or the you know, uh, BM, uh, BMG and so on. So. Well, great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, let's all thank Dr. Dowd for her great presentation today.
much appreciated. Uh, and it's just wonderful to see old friends again. Um, yeah, thanks thank for you. having me. Um, yeah, next time I'll come to LA. <laughs> we look forward to it. Sunshine, all right.